I was actually giving a talk about three or four years ago, and as the speaker was introducing me, um, he made two mistakes. Number one, he introduced the wrong Ken Coates, which was really, really discouraging. Uh, there's a very famous Ken Coates, it's not the one, well, maybe you thought that's the one you were talking about, uh, who actually is a British par parliamentarian and academic. Um, and then at the very end, he actually uh, told the audience that I was going to give a completely different talk. So you'll be pleased to know that I've got, we got both the name and the, and the talk right. I, I've enjoyed this morning uh, tremendously. I, I must admit, coming from Western Canada, although I lived in Waterloo for, for six years, um, that I did suffer from an acronym overload this morning. You have a vocabulary that's quite unique to economic development and to, and, and to Ontario generally. Um, appreciated Conrad's entrepreneurial talk at the end. I, in Waterloo, you spend a lot of time with entrepreneurs. Um, it's a very interesting ecosystem in terms of high technology. Um, really enjoyed all that, although following on Conrad's lead, I promise absolutely not to sing. And Conrad, I'll just make one su suggestion when you're doing happy birthday next time is just take two steps back from the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> the sentiment was wonderful. The uh, singing was way too close to mine, so. I'm, I'm really delighted, delighted to be here and have a chance to, to talk to you. The, the, the challenge that you're tackling about rural economic development is uh, absolutely, absolutely formidable. Uh, trying to help small town Canada, rural Canada adjust to the transitions we see in front of us, and I'll talk about those a bit later, um, is, a, is a really interesting challenge. I know how hard the work is, um, how few the accomplishments end up being. Failure is a part of economic development. Um, but in rural Canada, sometimes it seems to be far more of a characteristic than we want it, want it to be. Um, it's kind of interesting, as I was thinking about coming here and speaking to you, realizing how to, the degree to which my life has been defined by life in small towns. I wasn't born in the Yukon. I was born in Banff, Alberta, which is even more unique than being born in, in, um, in, in the Yukon. Lots of babies are conceived in Banff, but not very many actually are still there nine months, nine months later. Um, then moved to Revelstoke, British Columbia, was raised actually, was raised in Whitehurst until I went, went to university. But after I went to university, I discovered a, a lifelong uh, distaste for large cities, which unfortunately is complicated by the fact that my wife loves them. Um, and you're going to see who wins in these conflicts as we go forward. Um, I then moved to Brandon, Manitoba, uh, Victoria, BC, to Prince George, where we set up the University of Northern British Columbia, which actually was a university focused on, its, its mandate was to improve the economic development of Northern British Columbia, um, and actually had a very significant effect in that regard. I then went down to Hamilton, New Zealand, um, which is the only non-coastal city in, in New Zealand, the middle of the Waikato, which is one of the best agricultural and horse ranching areas in, in, in the world, actually. Um, from there to St. John, uh, New Brunswick, where I was very heavily involved in economic development at the, at the urban level, to Saskatoon, then to Squamish outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, and back to Waterloo, where one of the major things I did while I was the Dean of Arts at the University of Waterloo was to develop a... Um, a digital media campus in the city of Stratford, um, which is essentially undertaken as a, as a significant local economic development project that I'll talk about at the very end. So let me just put this in some context before we sort of jump in and go, to, go too far. Um, I am really worried about the decline in rural Canada. Um, really worried about the scale. We'll talk about the kind of individual problems, but there's two parts to this. One is the overselling of, of urban life. Um, I've lived in big cities and can hardly wait to escape. Um, if you look at the research that is being done on the experience there, the creation of ethnic ghettos inside our major cities, the huge disparities of income between the very, very wealthy and the very poor in the cities, the growing number of problems in Canada, or urban environments, I worry about the fact that we are simply accepting as a country um, that these cities will continue to grow. We are, if we're not already there, we're on the verge of creating a city-state economy. Uh, in Canada, we will probably, if you do, unless we, unless we're successful, unless you're successful, far more than me, um, we will have maybe six to eight major economies in the country, and you will have a bunch of rural areas that do nothing but produce re resources for those areas and provide recreational retreats. Uh, both are valuable. I'm a huge fan of resource development and not properly done. Recreational tourism areas are really important. But in fact, we need a country that actually stretches from coast to coast to coast and has vibrancy and vitality and economic opportunity in all areas. 
well, I can stop now. <laughs> that's, 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 that's great. Um, but, but here's another side. Here's another side. So this is, this is me. I'm, I'm actually a really optimistic person by, by nature. We are in the middle of the most rapid scientific and technological innovation boom in world history. We have never, ever seen anything like it. Digital media is a really good example. Digital media is the most overhyped economic sector in world history and the most underestimated. The things that have worked are not the things that we thought would work. The things we thought would work didn't end up working. Remember how grocery stores were going to close down and vans would deliver it to your door? People lost a couple of billion dollars on that particular play. But when you start thinking about what science and technology can do and will do in, in the rest of our lifetimes, and this is not 100 years from now, it's not Jetsons and science fiction, um, think of some very simple things, new energy. Uh, they're developing new nuclear power plants that will be basically the size of, well, three times the size of this podium. They could power a community of 1,500 people for 15 years at basically almost no cost. And that technology exists. Water filtration systems that are uh, using nanotechnology that will actually purify water much better than almost any filtration system we have right now. Coca-Cola is implementing a thousand of these all across Africa to demonstrate their, their value and their use and their utility. Um, we haven't even begun to explore the potential of deep geothermal. Um, going way, way down underground. If you go way far enough down underground, every place on Earth has energy resources available close at hand. Give us five years, maybe 10, and we'll start talking about deep geothermal as being a solution for our economic challenges. If you haven't read about 3D printing, read about 3D printing. Um, in not so very long, you will be able to get your Blackberry, and anybody who has an iPhone, please leave the room, You'll be able to get your BlackBerry printed for you in any community that you, will, you live in anywhere in the country. This 3D printing will transform the concept of manufacturing and localization and personalization and what have you. When we start getting to digital medicine, when your smartphone actually is more important to your long-term health than your doctor, you realize that one of the major challenges of living in small towns will actually evaporate. My favorite story about this has to do with Japanese toilets. I, I love telling this in North America because you're all really squeamish about toilets. You think you're the only person in the country who has to go to the toilet, nobody else. You don't know what to talk about. The Japanese love it. Children's books have people pooping all the time, right? And they talk about toilets. Anyway, Japanese have these remarkable toilets. The toilets can sing. They have music built in. Um, they, they have, you know, all, the, the things they can do are really quite quite disgusting. Um, but one of the things they've done is they've developed uh, toilets that actually do urinary analysis. If you have teenage kids, it's a really good idea. <laughs> and, 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 and what happens is when you go to the bathroom, if, just, to, just assume you're a diabetic. When you go to the bathroom, you get instant urinary analysis. It is sent to your doctor. Your doctor can look at this and says, listen, you're outside, outside the, the, the frame. You've gone too far, too up, up or low. You spiked up or down. The doctor looks at this and says, yes, presses a button. The message goes directly to the pharmacist. The pharmacist looks at that and says, oh, I have to change the medication, pushes a button. Your, cell, your smartphone gets a voice ringing saying, go to the pharmacy and pick up your medication. Actually, in Japan, we're just sending your medication to your house. You'll have it in an hour and a half, right? This whole process involves basically almost no human intervention, doesn't require you to go to the doctor, and probably takes 10 minutes. So, Technology can do amazing things, and we are really at the cusp of this, con this, this revolution. But small town Canada hasn't capitalized on these opportunities, and I'm going to come back and talk about the innovation opportunities a little bit later on. I've always been impressed with, with small towns. I used to live in Brandon. I was driving around in the country one time. Did you ever have insurance from Wawanisa Insurance? If you remember Wawanisa, right? I didn't know Wawanisa was a town. I thought it was somebody's last name from Poland. Uh, and it turned out it, it, it probably was somebody's last name from Poland or somewhere, but it turns out that Wawanisa was a town just outside of, of Brandon. And I remember driving into this town, and it's not a very big town, with one huge big building. And that used to be the headquarters for Wawanisa Insurance. You know, this, they, they had those kind of operations in these small towns. And you know in the southern Ontario here, you have lots of communities that had, you know, chocolate factories and, and parts manufacturing, many of which are gone. Fifteen years ago in Saskatchewan, the Minister of Finance, a friend of mine, in one day closed down 92 communities. It was her job to pull all government services out of 92 communities across this province of Saskatchewan. And to her great credit, she went to every one of them and explained to them that she was actually pulling 
all remaining government services out of, out of, those, out of those communities. Absolutely interesting to watch. You drive through Saskatchewan and see towns that 25 years ago were okay and that now are all closing down. The other extreme, I spent a lot of time in Fort McMurray. Anybody ever been to Fort McMurray? Um, really interesting town. The mythology is completely wrong about Fort McMurray. It's a boom town. There's no question of that, but it's a town that's trying very hard, as all of you are, to actually build a long-term, stable, vibrant, uh, vibrant community. We have a real challenge building a 21st century economy in small towns. J reflect really quickly on your conference theme. It's a wonderful one. Um, you have four, three main concepts, rural resilience, entrepreneurship, and innovation. The rural resilience is kind of interesting. The, those two words are redundant. Um, rural areas, by definition, are, are, are resilient. That is simply the dominant characteristic, agriculture, farming, forestry, or whatever else. Um, to be rural is to live a resilient life. Uh, on a personal level, on a community level, it just is the way it is. Entrepreneurship is perhaps our greatest shortcoming as a nation. Um, I don't mean to put too sharp a, a, a sort of line on this, but essentially we are a nation of managers, of employees, of civil servants, and increasingly of grant writers. Um, I, was, I, was, I was talking to somebody one time who was really mad. He was in New Brunswick. So anybody from New Brunswick, I, you never heard me say this. Um, and he, I said, well, how would you, you, are there lots of entrepreneurs in, in New Brunswick? And he said, well, according to whose definition? I said, well, your definition. He said, well, my definition of an entrepreneur in New Brunswick is somebody who applies for two grants in one year. <laughs> and you realize how, many, how much time is spent, how much time all of us spend, including all of you, managing grant applications and processing grant applications, if we ever added it up. If we ever actually did a proper cost accounting for what it takes in terms of grant applications and then did an, a process at the other, set, other side of what it costs to actually administer grants that you receive, it, poor Justice Gomery did Canada a huge disservice when he brought in all the new accountability standards because they're actually choking us off. Um, I actually got a government grant offered to me a couple of months ago and I turned it down and did the work for free. Uh, because, in fact, the cost of uh, the time it would take to me to apply for the grant and actually uh, you know, do all the accountability things wasn't worthwhile. The government needed the work done, so I did it. But I wasn't interested in going through that kind of process. But entrepreneurship, two kinds, right? There is the kind of, we always think of entrepreneurship as one thing. It's, it's two very different things, at least in my estimation. It's probably more than that. One is running a business for a profit. We actually do okay. We have lots of people, small business people in particular, who run businesses for a profit. They're good managers and they're effective, whether there's a bed and breakfast or a car dealership or whatever else. The second one is inventing and creating. And actually, we do really poorly in the inventing and creating side. On a global scale, we are uh, nowhere near the top in that area. And in fact, we've been declining quite, quite steadily. But innovation, the third part of your thing. Um, does in as soon as universities start using words, you got to realize that they, their time has passed. Universities, we love universities, we're really slow. By the time we get around to thinking this is a good idea, it's like, oh God, that one's been out there for 15 years now. So, but when university, we lose, my, my, I have a Canada Research Chair in Regional Innovation, so I'm criticizing myself. Um, a lot of innovation is just smart business. It means changing with the times. And so you're responding to new markets or new opportunities. That's not so much uh, uh, a really dramatic thing. But innovation is also about radical and revolutionary change about trying to anticipate the future or actually making the future. Spend time with Jim Balsley and Mike Lazaridis, who actually developed a whole sector in smartphone technology. But realize this, and I get, guarantee you that 90% of you in your communities know the reality of this. Innovation is one of the greatest job killers in Canadian society. When you bring in innovation, it costs about $100,000 to replace a worker. If you can actually find a robot that can replace a human being, it costs $100,000 for that robot, people will do it. If you look at what's happening, well, I'll use the pulp and paper industry, for example. Pulp and paper industry has de destroyed 10 or 20 or 40 or 50,000 jobs across the country by upgrading their processes. They had to do it. If they didn't upgrade their processes, they wouldn't be competitive, they wouldn't be efficient, they would lose market share, and they'd go broke. So it's not a bad thing. Kid at British Columbia. Alcan was faced with the, Rio Tinto Alcan, was faced with the question about whether they would redo their plant. They had a huge smelter that was actually outdated. And they had a choice, close the plant down and lose 1,500 jobs. Invest $2 billion and actually save 750 jobs. You want a Hobson's choice? There it is. You don't want to close the place down, 
But by modernizing the plant, they'll lose almost half of the jobs in the community. And that has become a huge problem for us on the manufacturing and processing side. <clears throat> so where do we go from here? First off, remember that the digital age got off to a real false start. You remember this about 15 years ago when people started talking about internet technologies? <clears throat> I was a very early adopter. I've been a fan of the internet from, from early, earliest times possible. But do you remember the promise you could work anywhere? The idea was this was going to be the savior of small town North America. You don't have to live in the city anymore. You can live wherever you want. You can telecommute. You can sit in your pajamas and participate in meetings. I remember seeing these things in Time Magazine and McLean's Magazine and wow, you know, the, the big city congestion is going to disappear. It didn't happen. I don't know if you noticed what happened with Yahoo the other day. They told all their employees to come back to work because it turns out that in their company this did not particularly, it wasn't particularly successful. However, the digital age has been destructive of small towns. You think what's happening to your retail sector? Connor was talking about this. He's absolutely, absolutely right. The retail sector is being destroyed by the fact that you can buy all this kind of stuff online. And it's only at the early stages of that. We're going to get much more sophisticated at, at, at internet-based retail in the years, years to come. The communities that benefited from telecommunity were all in the shoulder areas, within an hour and a half's drive from a major city. So people who could live, say, in Kitchener, or live in Fergus, or live in Stratford, and drive into Toronto one day a week for a day of meetings, those places did all right. The further you got away, the impact turned quite negative. So what is this 21st century economy that we're supposed to get lined up with? Well, if you spent much time traveling, you'll know what it looks like. It's globalized. <laughs> um, what well, we saw with manufacturing, we've watched you in southern Ontario have seen the devastation of the manufacturing sector, through particularly through Chinese competition. Chinese competition is getting too expensive now. They're starting to move factories from China to the Philippines. They've already moved them to Thailand. They're going to be opening up in Burma. And Africa is the place to watch. Africa is really coming on stream much faster than people thought. But the global competition is extremely real. It is incredibly competitive. Right? Unless you're serving a local market that's place-bound, it's an incredibly competitive marketplace. And it's technologically enabled. Uh, people know how to use high technology. It's some, interesting. I can't remember how many hundred thousand American tax forms are done in India every year now. The people who get all the, the, the accountants over there working away on their tax system. Um, what's really interesting, too, is an awful lot of medical imaging work is being done in India. And even something as simple as doctor's notes. And uh, what they do is people who doctors can write out their notes by hand. You can't ever read them. Uh, they fax them over to people in India. They get two different people to write them out and, and sort of uh, merge them together to figure out what the doctor was trying to get at. And the next morning, the notes are all back on your desk for about one-tenth of what it would cost to have a Canadian stenographer actually go through and produce that particular material. So the 21st century economy is kind of scary. You know, resource-based companies, they'll do all right. Local service companies providing food, milk for the people down the street, they'll do all right. But things where you're subject to international competition, um, boy, that's going to be a challenge. The impact on rural and small-town Canada is going to be very, very profound. Rural society um, is in a crisis, and you need to know that it's on a global scale. We always talk about the Canadian problems and the Canadian realities, but it's much, much larger than that. Um, in fact, the crisis really is truly global. You ever walk through, go to an Air Canada thing, and there's a HSBC has these signs down there, and one of the things has a little Volkswagen with a bunch of stuff piled on top. 200,000 people a day are leaving, leaving rural areas for, for the cities. Um, we are in a mass movement toward the cities at, a, at an enormous, enormous scale. Rural areas are losing population, but more importantly, they're losing the key people. It's not just they're losing people, they're losing the key people, the best educated, the most entrepreneurial, the most creative. There's a shift of jobs and business to the cities. We're also seeing remarkable innovations in the workplace. Um, I'm from the Yukon, I spend a lot of time in northern Canada. It's really interesting watching the impact of fly-in, fly-out camps where the people don't live there anymore. They don't bring their wives, they don't bring their children, they don't bring their families, they don't build homes, they don't spend their money. Uh, they live in Toronto, they live in Vancouver, and Edmonton, and Calgary, and Saskatoon. Uh, we actually have a lot of people in Saskatchewan who are farmers, um, and they, they actually spend you know, a, you know, a, month, a month on the farm, and then they go for a month up north, and then come back down again. The impact on the north is actually profound. Those are the things we were counting on to build northern, northern economies. 
But let me also talk about something that we don't talk about in Canada. And it's been mentioned a couple of times, Conrad in particular drew attention to this. Um, we are one of the, we have the best country in the world, by the way. If you have ever, I, I spent all last year, I'll talk about this in a minute, traveling around the world. We have an amazing country with decent, wonderful, nice people, wonderful services and everything like that. And we ask less of Canadian citizens than any country on the face of the earth. No compulsory military service, not our taxes are getting lower all the time. We don't ask Canadians to do anything. And guess what? They don't. <laughs> they, there is almost no commitment to this country. <laughs> absolutely very little commitment to this country. Uh, we have a massive outflow of ideas, of technology, of companies, and of key personnel. And we just accept it as a matter of course. If you go to Japan or Taiwan, I'll use an example in Taiwan. For a long time, Taiwan was a relatively very poor country. It's been improving massively. I was in Taipei 15 years ago, went back last year. Unbelievable difference. It went from a, a sort of looking like, like, like Bangkok, a sort of a, a sort of decrepit sort of third world country, to looking like Tokyo in 15 years. Subway systems all over the place and rapid transit system, unbelievable transformation in that area. So over the years, a lot of people left Taiwan and they came to North America. The president's office in Taiwan has an office that actually does nothing but phones ex-Taiwanese people and tells them to come home. It says, you gotta come home, right? And if, I, I'm, I mentioned this to, at, at a meeting and somebody said, oh, you're exaggerating, you know, that doesn't really happen. And the guy in the room said, hold on a second, I'm from Taiwan, I got my call last week. <laughs> uh, and they don't just say come home, they say come home and if you've got a business, we'll actually give you a factory, we'll give you tax-free status for three or four years. And if that doesn't work, we'll actually invoke the spirit of your grandparents. <laughs> you know, you have to come back. The only person to try that systematically in, Toronto, in Canada was Frank McKenna uh, in New Brunswick, where he did exactly the same thing of telling people to come home. So we have trouble on a national scale, we have a much greater trouble on a local, regional scale. So holding people is difficult. My wife has something that she calls a latte index. Uh, how she defines, the, she's from Vancouver, so that's all you need to know about her. <laughs> <coughs> and basically, Karen's sort of line is when she goes into a community, um, and she, you know, what, what's its latte index? You know, does it, does it have enough coffee shops? Because for her, this is, you don't need any of these fancy, sorry about this, you other guys at, at Florida Institute. Um, you don't need all these creative class things. If you have coffee shops that actually know what a mochaccino is, then you've actually reached a level of sophistication that's sufficient for somebody from Vancouver. And, and for Karen, the latte index is sort of covers everything from restaurants to professional classes and all those other, all those kind of things. Um, a lot of small towns don't have it. They don't have those extra bits, those extra little, the latte cup, the latte uh, re cafes. However, it's great deeper than that. Popular culture is killing small town Canada. Almost all the television programs are about ba major cities. The ones that are about small towns make fun of small towns. Little Mosque on the Prairie. Everybody in that town who wasn't uh, from the Middle East was an idiot, right? <laughs> or an Anglican, and sometimes they're almost the same thing. <laughs> I shouldn't say things like that. I was, just, I was just kidding, I was raised an Anglican so I can say whatever I want. <laughs> but popular culture has killed the idea of a small town. We used to celebrate the small town. We used to honor it. We used to love the sense of community, the vibrancy, the, the friendship, the partnership, the, the family orientation. We've, we've done a really good job of kicking the heck out of that one. We have as well the magnetic power of cities. Cities are really harsh places. They're hard places to adjust to. But young people grow up in small towns with the idea that they have to leave. That in fact they've let themselves down or their families down if they don't plan on leaving. We have the assumptions about the creative class. The idea that the pooling of talent happens in the cities and can't happen in small, smaller areas in the same way. We have an entitlement society where we have extremely high service expectations. My daughter-in-law is a doctor who was working in Mount Forest uh, for about four or five years. And it was interesting when she was talking to her about the other doctors, and the doctors had trouble convincing themselves to stay there because they didn't have the same quality of facilities that they had in Toronto or in Hamilton or even in Wa on Waterloo. So the doctors expected great facilities, the people there expected great facilities. We just think we'll have everything. Well, the place to have everything is by definition in the cities. We also don't have a culture of support for rural life. I'll tell you a really quick story about what's called Golden Week in Japan. It happens at the end of April, early May. It varies a little bit. And um, it's really interesting because in Japan, you honor the homes of your ancestors. You are from some place. 
And uh, that place is very seldom Tokyo or Osaka. It's usually your family roots go back into these small communities. When that golden week happens, the trains are so full. You, did, and you simply can't imagine how full these trains are of people who go back to their home communities every single year to remember and to value their sense of place. There's nothing comparable to that yet in Canada. So go back to the global perspective. Um, one of the great joys is a huge privilege of being a university faculty member is we get what's called administrative leave or sabbatical. And that means they give you your salary until you can do whatever you want. What I wanted to do was I wanted to go in search of viable small towns. Um, and so for 2011 and 2012, my wife and I and my daughter traveled the world trying to figure out what small communities were doing um, to respond to the crises of, of rural economies. And we weren't there to sort of do a thousand interviews and try to come up with you know, detailed case studies. We wanted to get a sense of what was happening on the ground. So to give you a bit of a sense of scale of where we went, um, Africa, Scandinavia, the Middle East, Japan, China, Southeast Asia and Vietnam and Thailand, Australia, New Zealand, Alaska, and Northern Canada. It was a very busy, very busy year. It was a remarkable exposure to a whole bunch of very different approaches most of which were based on the old economies. So by going back to the idea of creating the new economy in, in, in these areas, most of what people were doing around the world was based on the old economy. So what are the old economy and new economy processes? I can't describe them all, obviously. Um, number one, good fortune, being close to natural resources. Um, there's a place called Olympic Dam in Australia. It's a huge, huge, big mine. When the open pit is, fit, is open and is finally developed, it will actually be a, have a larger footprint than the city of Saskatoon. It'll be three and a half kilometers by five kilometers wide and circle in, 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 in scale. Absolutely stunning. Uh, Fort McMurray, watching a community explode in population very quickly. This is actually Canada's greatest element. We were doing okay on natural resources. Anybody visit Saskatoon or go to Estevan? a place that nobody in Canada has ever been to. Anybody been to Estevan? Oh, look at that. That's, that's a larger than usual number. Very nice town. I don't mean I don't like Estevan, just nobody's ever been there. Um, this community is absolutely exploding right now. Um, the Tragically Hip performed there the other day, which is a sign that it's actually a creative class kind of stuff. That I'm not sure if Tragically Hip counts as creative anymore, but it did it at, at, at one point. Good Fortune is actually behind an awful lot of rural economic development. Second one is, and this is somewhat old economy, is a national commitment to equality of circumstance. There are some countries that simply say that you will have the same quality of life regardless of where you live. Norway and Sweden are the best examples of this. The roads will be as good in the north as the south, the hospitals, the healthcare, the education, the universities, the college training, the infrastructure, internet infrastructure and what have you. Um, those countries are doing really well. Those towns are doing extremely well. Um, it's kind of interesting traveling around rural Ontario. I have, I have a, a company that starts with R that delivers my, uh, uh, my, my BlackBerry uh, inform information. I get way, way better coverage in rural Vietnam than I do in rural Canada. Uh, in rural Vietnam, which is a very poor country, you, the coverage is just like 100% in the middle of the mountains and all that kind of stuff. Not, not so much here. Um, other ones, beauty spots, tourism and recreation, seasonal centers are, are doing really, really well. Um, it's really hard to build a long-term economy off of a seasonal industry like that. But, but people are trying. Um, there are lots of bright spots. A lot of them here in southern Ontario are doing very well in that regard, but also across, across Canada generally. And the, the last one is major infrastructure projects. We were down in Brazil a couple of years ago. They're building major highways that are making small towns into big cities. You know, you open up a highway, then all of a sudden you can get into this area and big, big things happen. Um, in Canada, we talk about pipelines and, and hydropowers and things of that sort. There are also some new economy approaches. Um, number one approach that we, not the first one, not the best one necessarily, we saw in the Middle East. Uh, what happens if you're stinky rich and you build a new economy? It helps. It really helps. We were in Qatar, and Qatar has a lot of sand and a lot of camels, um, and that's about it. But there's also oil and gas. And what Qatar is doing is saying, okay, our oil and gas is going to run out. So they're building extremely expensive new economy operations, one of the best science medicine institutes in the world. And they figure that when the oil and gas runs out, they're still going to have one of the best science um, medicine facilities in the world. But it costs an awful lot of money. That's not going to happen in Canada. Um, Ottawa, 
well, Queen's Park doesn't have any money anymore, but Ottawa still has some, and you're not going to get hundreds of billions of dollars being spent on new development projects in, 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 in rural, small-town Canada, with the exception of the Territorial North. And it's really interesting, you're going to watch and see the Territorial North continue to, continue to leapfrog most other rural and small-town areas. Whitehorse uh, and Yellowknife in particular are doing extremely well. Um, other areas in the north are doing not badly. Um, corporate commitment. This is one that we saw completely in Japan and, and Taiwan. These are companies that have 50, 100-year roots. Um, Toyota City, Toyota City is actually a place. Uh, and it's really interesting watching these towns where the company is basically committed to that rural area or that small town. And they continue to invest in the small town and keep it going and sustained. We're doing the opposite here. We have mostly multinational corporations. The manufacturing gets off, off, offline a little bit, and we pull the manufacturing out. There is some model also of what I call intense collaboration. Um, if you ever get a chance, go to Skelleftia in Sweden. Let's see if you can spell that. Uh, Skelleftia is in northern Sweden. It's actually up almost to the point where Sweden becomes Finland. You know how Sweden sort of takes that turn, turn to the east, and Finland joins it up there? Skelleftia is up right near the top. And there's another little town right close by called Lulia. So Skelleftia and Lulia are about an hour and a half, two hours apart from each other on the road. And both of them realized that, in fact, the future was going to be in digital media. And what Skelleftia did was they said, We're gonna, we've got a very well-trained workforce that had some manufacturing things shut down. And they went after a whole bunch of companies like Google and convinced these companies to relocate their digital media op operations in Skelleftia. And as soon as you got one, you got two, you got three, you got four, a town only about 30,000 people, um, you, know, you don't need 8,000 8, 8, jobs. If you end up with getting 500 jobs in a town of 30,000 people, that makes a huge impact. And Lulio actually is developing itself as a server base. Uh, they got hydroelectric potential in the air, and they're doing very well. Those communities work because the entire community got together. And actually, and it's interesting here, government was not the lead. Government was actually the support enterprise here. It was actually the business community, people got together and said they were going to create something very new. And that takes you back to my observation before about the fact that, that uh, I think Canadians are lack commitment. Uh, to not, not you, you do, you're living a very different kind of life, um, lack commitment to their community and to, even to their country. Um, the, the last one is really an interesting one. Uh, we haven't seen this very often in Canada. You see it a few other places, uh, particularly in Asia, happening increasingly in Asia. Um, philanthropic investors. Has anybody heard of Fogel Island? Oh, yeah, you guys would. <laughs> in this group, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, it's actually very rare. Uh, Zita Cobb, a very rich investor, uh, a multimillionaire, um, basically is creating a high-end luxury retreat center with you know, on the middle of an island that's just full of fog and ice and rain and snow and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I always remind people of this. In the late 19th century, beach property was considered waste. It was like swampland. If you had swamp over here and beach over there, they were e equally without value. Until people discovered that they could actually make something valuable out of it. It was called a sunburn, right? And so they, they, they convinced people that a beach was good instead of bad. So I think what they're trying to do at Fogo Island is say, fog, boy, are we ever lucky. You know? hey, and rocks, we got really big rocks. This would be really fun. Um, anyway, the idea of a philanthropic investor. You know, why not angel investors for whole regions <coughs> as opposed to individual companies? Doesn't happen very often. Let me give another really odd option. Not an odd option, but a very sad situation that you want to think about. In March uh, 2011, there was a horrific earthquake in, in Japan, northern part, northeastern part of Japan. You probably saw all these films of thousands of people being swept out to sea. And, and if you ever saw the pictures of devastation, community after community, literally driven into the ground. Whole buildings wiped out, you know, farms and houses and everything like that. Destroyed the whole communities. The government response, if you want to ever see a difference between Japan and the United States, take a look at, at New Orleans and take a look at Tohoku region in Japan. They had actually the roads back up and running uh, within a matter of a couple of months. The reconstruction has been absolutely, absolutely astonishing. My wife was up there last March uh, taking a look around. This was an area that was economically depressed, um, sort of like the Maritimes, uh, you know, the, the coastal parts of, of, of the Maritimes in, say, Nova Scotia, more than, more, than, uh, more than Newfoundland. Small villages, aging population, young people all moving away. Uh, manufacturing centers, the local for Japanese audiences, but markets, but declining very rapidly as well. So Tohoku region had a choice, and it came down to this. 
One group of people, the elderly, said to the government, and the government said off the, right off the bat, we are going to rebuild Tohoku. We're not walking away. And we're going to, not in the short term, we're going to pour in literally hundreds of billions of dollars. We're going to rebuild this area really fast. So one group, the elderly, who were the ones who were still there, basically said, we want our towns and villages built like they were before. So imagine if you and your communities had a do-over. Imagine the situation if you could take a fairly large region, the southeast part of Ontario, and all of a sudden everything's flattened. And the government comes and says, you can build from scratch. What would you do if you would start over? Well, this is not a good story. It's a tragic story. But now you have a do-over. So the elderly are saying, we want, those villages are everything to us. Our ancestors are from there. Our history is there. Our culture is there. Rebuilt. Another group, the young people, including the young people who left the area because there was nothing to do, said, don't do that. Take the money instead and build four or five larger cities. We don't want to live in Sendai or Osaka or Tokyo or Nagasaki. We actually want to go back to Tohoku region, but we don't want to go back to a village of 3,000 people. We would love to go back to a town of 45,000 and be part of a city that actually has an economy of scale. But most of the ones who are promoting this don't live there anymore. They left because of what the small towns did not have to offer. So they're now in the middle of this very large debate that, at least to this point, is being won by the elderly that will result in the rebuilding of economically non-viable communities and rebuilding of villages that are basically going to depopulate within a generation. They've already substantially happened. And it's very fascinating watching this debate about this do-over. And I hope none of you ever have a chance to even contemplate this, because it's a horrible, horrible circumstance. But it is interesting, even at that juncture, to see the tension between those two operations. So let me offer a couple more thoughts. We have a model that perhaps you all know about. Um, and I, I call it, tell, tell everybody around the world it's called the Stratford model. Um, and it's one that I think works extremely well. Um, you'll know perhaps uh, Mayor Dan Matheson. John Wilkinson was the former uh, member of the Legislative Assembly, member of Provincial Parliament uh, for, for Stratford. This is a town that had inspired leadership. Uh, this is the town of the Stratford Festival, going through very serious economic decline. The auto parts sector had been really damaged in the early part of the 21st century. Lots of factories closing down, high unemployment. I don't know if you know this, but Stratford is, uh, has one of the highest uh, problems, incidents of uh, crystal meth use in Canada. Um, it's very, uh, not a very happy part of their story. And they're very anxious to rebuild the community using the Stratford Festival as a base, tourism as a base. They still had a manufacturing sector. And they started conversations basically saying, where shall we go in the future? They had also a very strong and effective council. And by strong and effective, I don't mean they just agreed with everything the mayor said. They actually pushed the mayor uh, really hard to make sure that all the ideas were sort of thought through. But they also were risk taking. And risk aversion is the number one barrier to doing anything effective on local economic development. I'm working with a couple of people in northern Ontario right now on some projects they're working on. And I can tell you that those two communities have just lost probably $10 million of investment uh, because they're so risk averse. They just quit putting up barrier after barrier after barrier that the companies are moving their operations out of town. They haven't even started operations. This is, they're just getting the venture capital going. And they've decided they can't work there. Right? This community had that. And they were looking around saying, what does our future hold? And they were open to this. They didn't, they didn't have a particular idea. They hadn't fixated on something. <clears throat> but they wanted to find out what was out there. Anyway, the core, identify, uh, the core that they had decided on was actually digital media. They looked at that and said, what we have is we have one of the densest concentrations of the creative class anywhere in Canada because of the Stratford Festival. Brilliant artisans and actors and musicians and singers and dancers and performers and content developers and videographers and everything else you can imagine. And so working with the University of Waterloo, we created a digital media campus that opened up just about just last year. The city then invested massively in infrastructure, brought in high-speed internet into the community. They actually then went off and recruited some private companies who came in and put in server capacity. One of the major banks has its backup supply. They used to have their backup for this major bank was actually right underneath the CN Tower. 
And the CN Tower is, I think, the number fourth, number one terrorist target in, in North America or something like that. So it's like, well, that's not a very good place to have all your banking information. So they moved us out to, to Stratford, which is a much healthier place. They created free wireless all over the whole city. Walk around the whole city, you have wireless for you everywhere. They made a huge commitment at the educational level. Uh, both at the college, university, and the high school level, got wide business participation into understanding what digital media was. We used to have seminars down there all the time about digital media. We'd have this many people coming out to find out what this new economy section was all about. They, they experimented politically. They had online voting in 2010. Uh, there was no physical voting at all. They took computers into senior citizens' homes and hospitals so people could vote uh, wherever they were. And they had a 2% increase in participation, which is kind of interesting. They also understood the global environment. They were very interested in what was happening internationally, and they pushed for national and international recognition. Some of you may have heard of the Canada 3.0 conferences. Uh, three consecutive conferences of the first year was really funny. We organized a conference that was designed to bring together academics, uh, particularly the business sector and government, to talk about the future of digital media. And we thought, okay, we're going to try to get 400 people to show up at this conference. That, that's a good number. 400 people is actually a pretty big conference. So about three weeks to go, we had about 300 people. And we thought, okay, we can make another push and get over the 400 because, you know, then we'll get more politicians showing up to give you know, lectures and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, at the end of the day, we had 1,500 people show up and they had to shift from a, from a room like this. Um, we had to shift actually into two hockey rinks which was kind of int interesting. And the next two were actually even larger events than, than the first one. And it made Stratford into sort of synonymous with digital media and in, in, uh, content development in Canada. They also then entered the Intelligent Communities competition. And they haven't won yet, but they finished in the top seven intelligent communities in the world two years in a row. Um, and all of a sudden, they're getting visits from all sorts of interesting business people and venture capitalists and entrepreneurs and casual researchers. What the heck's going on in Stratford? You know, you're on this list with, uh, they, they finished, lost one year to Taipei. That's not bad. That's not bad. Um, and they've done really well in terms of drawing attention to themselves. They bought in. They bought in. So let me finish up with a couple of, a couple of thoughts. Um, I'm not one to talk about the technical and financial details. You've had some wonderful presentations this morning and look at financial issues and entrepreneur issues and all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm an historian by training and I like to sort of look at the broader perspective as much as I possibly can. The, the tools exist. You have the tools of government, of taxation. You have government grants you can apply for, even with my nasty comments about that. Um, the tools exist. You, you have you know, talent close at hand. The challenge is formidable and you need to recognize, as you all do, that you're, you're running against the global tide, that you're, you're fighting against one of the major forces of our time, which is mass urbanization. So it's not going to be an easy, easy job. But I think the one message I would offer is, is this. I think there's a much broader issue than the technical ones of money and talent and those kinds of things. We have to reimagine small town Canada. It's a very different concept. I mean, we've let popular culture We've let the popular imagination basically diminish the integrity, attractiveness, and appeal of living in small towns. I am 100% behind the idea that, in fact, human beings do better. If, or at least I should say, I shouldn't be judgmental about cities, even though I am. That, that people do better. They do well in small towns. That, in fact, if you've ever read Robert Putnam's book called Bowling Alone, one of the most dominant sort of experiences of our time is we're disconnected from community. We don't belong anywhere. We don't feel like we're part of anything anymore. We actually have to address the fact that our country at large, and in fact North America generally, has deprecated small town life. And that all the things you're pushing against is you're trying to sort of convince people to do something that runs counter to what all of their instincts are telling them. Because they've been hit by 30 or 40 years of small town declinism the horrible pieces of living in small towns. We have to actually reimagine the role and possibilities of small town Canada. We have to promote the positive attributes. I don't mean of your individual places. I have the whole concept of living in small towns. There's cost of living, a huge one. Uh, lifestyle sorts of questions. Outdoors activities. If you watch the, the uh, attendance um, that we've had in, in, um, in uh, uh, national parks, have been dropping very, very dramatically. In the, in the last 10 or 15 years. 
Um, partly because a lot of our national parks are historically based, and quite frankly, if you're a new Canadian, this stuff is really obscure. You know, my children have no idea who Isaac Brock is. Sorry, Brockville. Um, they don't know who Isaac Brock is. Somebody who's just moved here from Sri Lanka? No idea. And are they interested? Not at all. Right? New Canadians, bringing new Canadians to small towns is extremely, extremely difficult. Right? Because we start too late. And actually, if we bring them, there's also different ways when you actually can make it so they have to come to small towns. And as soon as they get there, they start plotting how to get to Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, or Kitchener, Waterloo, or Ottawa. Those are the places where they almost all end up within five years. So we have to challenge that part of making, making these places attractive to them. In Alberta, I don't think this is kind of weird, um, they're actually advertising for hunters. They're actually putting ads in the paper and saying, please go off and shoot something. Uh, you're not, you're not a human beings, but <laughs> please go off and shoot something. And, and the reason is that they've actually, and this is the same thing here, in New England, I haven't seen the numbers for Ontario, there's actually more deer in New England than at any time in human history. More time than when the Europeans first got here. Because people stopped hunting them. And actually, you gotta think of the deer are just like big mice with funny <laughs> antlers, right? And, and if you don't harvest them, if you don't put on a trap every once in a while, the mice take over. Well, deer are exactly the same thing. And actually, if you have too many of them, they get diseased and die. And they start getting really bad things happening and they start spreading the disease to animals. This is a bad thing, right? There actually has to be an equilibrium. We have people who don't know how to hunt anymore. And they don't go fishing. So we can market fishing and hunting to Americans who really like to hunt and kill things. Um, well, we, can, we can bring them up that way, but we don't do it ourselves and we don't market that as a huge and attractive part of what we have to offer. Lifestyle and a sense of community. It's, I find it really fascinating that we've actually lost ground on that one. That the idea that the small towns are exciting and dynamic places to be. And I think we actually need a new philosophy. Not a philosophy of rural life, a philosophy of life. That values rural and small towns in exactly the same way it values cities. We need cities. We need vibrant, dynamic cities. Canada has four or five of the world's top 20 cities. And we had a, that is a huge attraction and power for us. But we actually have probably 400 of the world's top small cities and small towns. They get no attention whatsoever. High quality of living, high standard of opportunity, lots of wonderful outdoor activities and what have you. So my message is this. We actually can build a 21st century economy for rural and small town Canada. It's, all, it's your job to do it, but I just get to sit here and watch you and admire what you're, what you're up to. But it requires a lot more than just building new businesses and creating jobs. We actually have to attract people to our towns, convince them to stay, and we have to connect up with the 21st century realities. One of your jobs is to actually go back to your communities and sell them on science and technology. Get them, there's no one magic bullet. There's no one particular scientific or technological innovation that's gonna work in every single one of your towns. It's gonna to vary from place to place to place. You're gonna see a huge variety in the way in which we take these things up. But to a degree that absolutely astonishes me, Canadians are horrible at looking at the future of technology. So I'll give you a contrast. If I said to you today, I want you to go to the best place in Canada the best place in Canada to search out the latest new technology. Where would you go? Waterloo. Waterloo? Waterloo's stores are terrible. You, you, would, you would, when you said Waterloo, absolutely. In terms of the science labs, 100%. Waterloo's a terrific place. So is Queens. Right? In, but I, I guess I, meant, I shouldn't be clear. On the retail side. The answer in Canada is like Future Shopper, Best Buy. Like, that's a real yawner, right? That technology is three years old by the time it gets into the stores. The best place in the world is a place called Akihabara. Akihabara is in downtown Tokyo. Um, Tokyo is the most amazing city in the world. Uh, it's just an astonishing, astonishing place. Akihabara is called Electric Town. Electric Town has an area, wow, oh, how large would it be? It's about maybe 15 blocks by nine blocks, entirely devoted to digital media. Like for guys like me, this is like absolute heaven. There are thousands of stores. Some of the stores are eight stories high. One entire floor, a, a room four times the size of this devoted, not, d devoted entirely to smartphones. You go to Future Shop and say, oh, I've got this real choice. There's 12, right? Nonsense. 
There are thousands. There are thousands. In, in Japan, they bring out things at least a year and sometimes two years ahead of what we see here. Half the things they bring out never go beyond Akihabara. They sell them there, the people look at them and say, ah, it doesn't work. Okay, it dies. We get the stuff years down the line. Remember when iPhone came out? We embarrassed ourselves when the iPhone came out. Do you remember the wonderful picture? They actually had an iPhone in a glass case in a shopping mall, and all these people were walking around it and looking and saying, this is like, well, this is like God. This is Stephen Jobs incarnated in a piece of plastic, right? It was just unbelievable. Um, the iPhone, there was really nothing new on the iPhone. It was beautiful design. Wonder, amazing marketing. iPhone gets more free marketing. Apple gets more free marketing than any company in the history of humanity. Um, but the actual technology itself was about five years behind Asia. The things that you could actually do with an iPhone have been commonplace. Go look at a company called Docomo if you want to see real, real innovation. They were, they were there before iPhone was there. It's just really fascinating. We don't have the mindset in Canada. We actually have some of the, uh, the most complacent consumers in the world. Compared to Korea, compared to Singapore, compared to Bangalore in India, we just like, oh, is that the price? Okay. Uh, is that the quality standard? You know, when the iPad, when I, iPods first came out, they had a 44% failure rate. Oh, that's not bad. <laughs> and if you mail it back to them, they'll mail you a new one in six weeks. Oh, that's pretty good. That's kind of right. We are terrible consumers in Canada, and as a consequence, our businesses are not very innovative. Other countries do way, way better. We need a vibrant small town environment in Canada. We need strong rural areas. It is your challenge to build local economies. It's part of our collective obligation to rediscover the value of rural and small towns. Let me end with a final thought that maybe is something we should all think about. I used to talk to young entrepreneurs at the University of Waterloo when they were, they had a, a thing called Impact where they brought all the young entrepreneurs together and they were really amazing, amazing groups of people as they are here at Queen's and, and other places. And they're sitting here talking about their plans and their careers and almost to the one they're all talking about when they can finally go to the United States. And they're sitting here having these really casual conversations of, you know, boy, you know, I, I got an opportunity in, in, uh, in, in Washington. I can go to visit Microsoft or I go to Silicon Valley or San Diego is really great. What San Diego, a couple of companies in San Diego would do, come to Waterloo Region in January and February and offer free tickets to come to San Diego. You go, whoa, that's smart. <laughs> you got eight feet of snow and all slush and all this kind of stuff and you go to San Diego, that's, whoa, kind of, that's unfair competition. But these kids were just automatically assuming they were going to the United States. So I asked them to stay. I said, I know what you're thinking of doing. Stay. You have no right to leave. You were nourished in the Canadian environment, right? You were educated at a world-class university, and Canada has dozens of world-class universities. You're going to go into an incubator that's developed by a Canadian government and funded by your local community, and you're going to develop this wonderful product. And your plan is to either do one of two things, either to move that down to Austin, Texas, or, or California, or you're going to go. You're going to prove yourself with your little innovation, and you're going to go down there and make big bucks in San Francisco. You have to stay. You have no right to leave, right? And you have to push back on us to make sure that we have the venture capital, the angel investors, the environment, the business environment. A student actually stood up to thank me at the end of the talk, the formal sort of thing, and he said, you know, I've been doing this for a number of years. He said, nobody has ever asked me to stay. We are the only country in the world that is so casual about citizenship, about obligation to community, at, at the local level and to country. Your competition is completely different. The most innovative science and technology environment in the world right now, as you all know for sure, is Israel. The kind of place where you think, why would you stay in Israel? Because you're committed to the place. You are determined to be there because you believe that a Jewish state should exist. The other places that are like that are actually like Taiwan. The Taiwanese don't leave like they used to. Japan, how many Japanese people do you see picking up their companies and moving out of the country? Singapore, where they have a whole bunch of structural things to keep entrepreneurs and innovators in their place. Finland, which is one of the most unique, deeply embedded entrepreneurial environments in the world with one of the strongest small town, small city innovation environments on the planet. They keep their entrepreneurs at home because those people believe first and foremost in their community, secondly in their country, and then third in themselves. Let's convince people to stay. Thank you.
It's either questions or dessert, right? <laughs> Um, I, I liked a couple of your comments. I was wondering if you have anything recommended for reading with regards to, um, I'm big on community, community-based collaborative solutions and working together. Um, are there any, I'm, I, I were, I, I'm a professor in business at Loyalist College. I also am a, what's called a faculty advisor for a group called Enactus Loyalist that works on community-based challenges to address their economic, their social, and environmental. Really trying to get that message out to a lot of the consortium potential partners out there. I'd love to have some literature, some guidance that I could lead, as opposed to me just preaching. Yeah. Is, do you have any recommendations as to where that type of access can come from? Well, let me just assess two books that I think you can get started with. Uh, one is called Abundance. Um, Abundance, it's a marvelous book about the, the future of technology. And it basically says, you know, here's, here's like 15 technologies that even if only five of them work, your life's gonna be changed forever kind of thing. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, the other one that I think we should all read is called Startup Nation, which is about Israel. Um, it's really interesting. You know, you know why Israel succeeds? I mean, I, I shouldn't ask that hypothetical question. I'll tell you why Israel, well, why these authors think Israel succeeds. It's because all the young men and women have to go into the army. By the time they're 20 years old, they've actually been shot at lots of times. They've made life and death decisions hundreds of times a month on a, on a regular basis. Entrepreneurship is really easy. When you've done that, you know, and you think, I, I'm, I'm, I love, I've got five kids, so I've been through this whole process. To, we have the most spoiled generation in human history, right? Have you noticed that? And it's all your fault because you're the parents. So you go, oh, yeah, that's really, we did a really lousy job at that, right? Um, and and in, if, you compare, if you compare young people in Canada, North America as well, to the kind of cutting-edge, driving, high-energy passion that you see in Israel, you'd be embarrassed literally embarrassed by what you'd see. Um, and if you see how you, that combines with what happens in, in Sweden and Norway, um, where they have this national commitment, you know, we're doing this for our country, you know, whereas here we're thinking, well, maybe I'll do it for myself. It's a very, very different mindset. So Startup Nation, uh, for sure. The Physics of the Future uh, is another one in terms of the um, sort of the science of, of, uh, of, uh, science of innovation. Physics of the Future, Abundance, and Startup Nation. Um, the other one, oh, shoot, and I am just, there's a, there's a wonderful book called Boulevard of Broken Dreams. Has anybody ever read Boulevard of Bo Broken Dreams? It's a, it's, it, it, this is going to depress you and you're all going to quit. So, but, but it's really, it's an American book. Um, and it, it's basically about how, the, um, how economic development strategies don't work uh, and why they don't work. And that one is really, really worth looking at. Because it basically points out to us that almost all of our strategies, if you actually go back and say, where did this come from? Nobody can tell you. They were all created by committees, <laughs> right? And so they, you look at this and you say, well, it was a modification of something we tried over here and we heard that a BC did this, but we modified it to make it adjust to the New Brunswick model because then it suited over here for Southern Ontario. Read Boulevard of Broken Dreams because it, it, and, and it actually ends up optimistically, so don't be too discouraged. But that particular book says, you know, we, we, we think we can throw a whole bunch of money in and get a whole bunch of money out the other end. Um, and economic development, I mean, here, here's my own bias. I think economic development is about building passion in people. I think actually that's where it starts. And if you do that, and people are committed to the area and they're, and they're risk takers and you, and you get the local population putting their money in, we actually have an awful lot of capital available uh, for, for venture, venture and, not, and angel investors. It's just sitting in people's bank accounts. And these are the rich developers who build a shopping mall down the street and people who invested in real estate here along the St. Lawrence, you know, 50 years ago and are now worth $50 million and won't, won't let any kids get access to their money. Uh, we actually have these things when the mindset starts to change. But Boulevard of Broken Dreams is one you all should read because I think it is a very, very good way of sort of putting your own work in context so when you see your own struggles, you'll say, okay, other people are having the same challenge.